Good morning. Good morning. And welcome to our service of worship today. Just as one preliminary matter, I noticed a couple of people couldn't find bulletins this morning. And so Rick has some. If you would like to get one, just give him a wave and he'll make sure you get one. We're trying to distribute them evenly between the two entrances, front and back. And um, so if there's not one in the front, look in the, in the entryway in the back. And there's another pile on that table. But it's good to see you all here this morning. Um, please remember to uh, fill out a prayer slip if you have a prayer request that you'd like to share this morning. And keeping Rick busy this morning, he will pick those up from you uh, during the first hymn this morning. I guess we can call it the big news of the day is that the fellowship hour returns as of this morning. We invite you to stay after for um, a cup of coffee following the service and some conversation with your friends and, and neighbors. Um, we're going to begin coffee hour with just beverages to share uh, for this Sunday, and uh, Presbyterian Women has offered to take on the coordinating of fellowship hour, and we'll be starting to build a schedule beginning with next Sunday. Just a general note that in your bulletin, as we start rebuilding some of these things that we had temporarily dismantled, there's a note from the worship committee reminding us, we could say that it takes a village to have a worship service on Sunday morning. There are a lot of different roles that different people play on Sunday morning, and as we re begin to rebuild that schedule, there will be a, a signboard with some opportunities to sign up for things next Sunday morning. And I encourage you to, uh, when you're looking around saying, somebody really ought to do that, uh, remember that you are somebody. <laughs> and as you are able, I know that we are in all different places in our lives in terms of what we are able to do sometimes, just what we're physically able to do. But I would encourage you to do your part from Sunday to Sunday and share in those opportunities to show the Lord's hospitality to each other and to all those who come into our sanctuary on Sunday mornings. Speaking of Presbyterian women, I'd also like to acknowledge with them all of those who have participated in Meals on Wheels. It's something that PW does, they do it very quietly and it doesn't call, call a lot of attention to itself, but for many, many years, way back before I came here, PW has been organizing members of our church to serve Meals on Wheels a number of times throughout the year, and that is uh, another one of those things that we do that shows the love of Christ in very simple ways. And as you do that, please know that you are appreciated for giving that time from your life. And then a final note, we've been receiving a special offering for relief in Ukraine during the Lenten season. And this week, a check for almost $2,400 was sent to Presbyterian Disaster Assistance on behalf of this congregation. Those are your gifts that you shared. When things like this come along, I can, I'm continually amazed at the, the generosity of this congregation when a need is placed before us. If you would still like to give to that offering, it's not too late. We will send off one more check in a couple of weeks if there are additional gifts given. But that is a wonderful opportunity and a tribute to um, the generosity of this church as we continue to hold the people of Ukraine in our prayers. And now on this second Sunday of Easter, let us lift up our hearts together and worship the Lord.
Let us all rise for the call to worship. Praise the Lord. Praise Praise God God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty heavens. Praise him for his acts of power. Praise him for his passing greatness. Praise him with the sounding of the trumpet. Praise him with the harp and lyre. Praise him with tambourine and dancing. Praise him with the strings and flute. Praise him with the clash of cymbals. Praise him with resounding cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Let us pray. Praise the Lord. Alleluia. Precious Lord, We celebrate through the witness of the resurrection your astonishing and amazing love for your people, not only on Easter, but on every day of our lives. Your goodness and mercy have lifted lifted us up in so many ways in the past. Your grace and love will be with us as we walk into the unknown future. Praise the Lord. Alleluia. Amen.
When we keep our fears and faults locked up inside us, it is hard to be healed and receive new life. So let us open ourselves to God in confession, trusting the Lord's desire to give us peace. Merciful risen Lord, we confess that our faith in you is unsteady. Our faith wavers and we lose sight of you, even though you have been walking beside us all the while. Forgive us, we pray. Open the scriptures to us and open our eyes that we might be more deeply aware of your presence. Renew us in Easter faith, hope, and love. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Jesus comes to us in our places of fear and doubt and speaks words of peace. Believe the good news. You have received the gift of new life in him. Thanks be to God. The peace of Christ be with you and also with you. first biblical reading this morning is from the book of Isaiah chapter 25 verses 6 through 9 and it's on page 1095 in the Pew Bible. The word of the Lord. On this mountain the Lord Almighty will prepare a feast of rich food for all peoples, a banquet of aged wine, the best of meats, and the finest of wines. On this mountain he will destroy the shroud that enfolds all peoples, the sheet that covers all nations. He will swallow up death forever. The sovereign Lord will wipe away the tears from all faces. He will remove the disgrace of his people from all the earth. The Lord has spoken. In that day they will say, Surely this is our God. We trusted in him and he saved us. This is the Lord. We trusted in him. Let us rejoice and be glad in his salvation.
The New Testament reading this morning is from the Gospel according to Luke, the continuation of the Easter story in Luke. We'll be reading from chapter chapter 24, verse 13 through verse 43. That's a much longer portion of scripture than we usually read on Sunday morning in the pulpit. So you may want to take your pew Bible and follow along just so you don't fall asleep. I don't mean that. (laughs) It's on page 1642 in your pew Bibles. I'm reading from the New Revised Standard Version. Now on that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, What are you discussing with each other while you walk along? They stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place there in these days? He asked them, What things? They replied, The things about Jesus of Nazareth who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things took place. Moreover, some women of our group astounded us, They were at the tomb early this morning, and when they did not find his body there, they came back and told us that they had indeed seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see him. Then he said to them, Oh, how foolish you are! And how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and then enter into his glory? Then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them the things about himself in all the scriptures. As they came near the village to which they were going, he walked ahead as if he were going on. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, because it is almost evening, and the day is now nearly over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, Were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road, while he was opening the scriptures to us? That same hour they got up and returned to Jerusalem, and they found the eleven and their companions gathered together. They were saying, The Lord has risen indeed, and he has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road and how he had made himself known to them in the breaking of the bread. While they were talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. They were startled and terrified and thought that they were seeing a ghost. He said to them, Why are you frightened? And why do doubts arise in your hearts? Look at my hands and my feet. See that it is I myself. Touch me and see. For a ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they still did not believe it because of joy and amazement, he said to them, Have you anything here to eat? 
they gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate it in their presence. Let's pray. Lord, open our hearts and our eyes that we might hear your word to us and know your living presence today. Amen. One evening this week, as I was relaxing in front of the TV, a scene from a medical drama I was watching struck a very personal chord with me. In one of the storylines that has stretched over many episodes on this series, the mother of one of the doctors was diagnosed with cancer. The doctor, her son, is an all-star world-class surgeon who routinely performs life-saving operations every week. But now he has to sit by as his mother endures surgery and chemotherapy. When the chemo no longer helps, he has to confront his anger and a sense of impotence when she isn't accepted into a clinical trial for a promising new therapy. But the hardest bridge to cross was when she and he had to accept that there would be no cure and that palliative care was the best course to follow. And they had many good days together until the medications could no longer help alleviate her symptoms. This week's episode began with the decision that the mother should enter hospice care. The son struggled again with having to accept that he couldn't save her but he took her home with him. The episode traced their last days together, the wise medical and emotional support of a hospice nurse and the mother's peaceful passing in her sleep with her son slumbering in a chair at her bedside. I was especially touched by the next scene. The hospice nurse had come back accompanied by what appeared to be the staff from a funeral home. They gently covered her body and rolled her away on a gurney. The son was left there in his silent, empty house. Where Laurie died at the Serenity Hospice House, the custom is for the staff who are present to line up at the door as the gurney passes by to pay their respects. On that night, and on occasions when I've been with other families in my role as pastor, I found that that can be one of the hardest moments. How do you know when it's time to leave the hospital? Or after the funeral, how do you know it's time to walk away from the graveside? or to get in the car and begin the long drive back home. This is the atmosphere that hangs over the two disciples on the road to Emmaus. We're not given any backstory. We have no idea who they are or why specifically they're walking toward Emmaus. Maybe it was their home. Or maybe they had followed Jesus from Galilee and were just staying in Emmaus during the Passover. There is a lot that we don't know about them. But Luke does give us some insight into what's going on in their hearts. He does this with two key words. First of all, he tells us they were sad. Luke said that when the stranger approached them on the road and tried to strike up a conversation with them, they stood still, looking sad. Everything in the story until much later suggests that they believed in their hearts that Jesus was dead. They tell the stranger about Jesus of Nazareth, his suffering and death, and add, but we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel, as if their hopes had been dashed. 
they were walking away from the scene of the tragedy, trying to accept his death and go home. The second insight comes when they tell Jesus about the women who reported to them about the angels and Peter's visit to the empty tomb. This is a point, as I alluded to in my email this week, where our English versions don't serve us especially well. The New Revised Standard Version, which I read, says in verse 22, some women of our group astounded us. The New Revised, the Inter International Version in our pews says that they amazed us. But the most natural way to translate the word Greek, the Greek word Luke uses, and the one that actually best fits into the story, is that they confused us. Jesus was dead. And as far as they knew, the reports of a couple of grieving women and an empty tomb didn't prove anything or offer them any comfort. It just made things more confusing. So as they walked along the road to Emmaus, not knowing that Jesus was walking at their side, they were sad and confused. I chose to read the long version of this story all the way to verse 43 because of two words we find in verse 41. Here the NIV probably gives the clearer translation and I actually cheated and read that from the pulpit. Jesus has appeared to the disciples. He has shown them the wounds in his hands and feet. And Luke says they still did not believe it. But this is a different kind of disbelief. This is the it's too good to be true kind of disbelief. Because now Luke says that it was because of joy and amazement that they disbelieved. And so the crux of the story is this. How did their sadness and confusion turn into joy and amazement? In that immediate scene, Jesus revealing himself, showing them his hands and feet and eating with them, walking with them and talking with them, obviously made all the difference in the world. And their testimony recorded in the Gospels and the book of Acts is the foundation for 2,000 years of celebrating the resurrection. It's the basis for our believing that God's new creation was inaugurated on that Easter day. Those were events that cannot be repeated. But the story also leaves us with two enduring witnesses to Jesus' resurrection. Luke tells us of how Jesus began with Moses and all the prophets and interpreted for the disciples the things the Hebrew scriptures teach us about him. And of course, the big moment in the story comes when Jesus takes bread, blesses and breaks it, and gives it to the two disciples in Emmaus. The scriptures and the sacraments, these are our enduring and authoritative witnesses to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So it's wholly appropriate that the church in our Presbyterian tradition put so much emphasis on these two things. Quoting from the Constitution of the Presbyterian Church USA, since the earliest days of the Reformation, Reformed Christians have marked the presence of the true church wherever the word of God is truly preached and heard and the sacraments are rightly administered in a community of disciplined discipleship. For this reason, we ordain our pastors as ministers of word and sacrament and to ensure the integrity of that witness of word and sacrament, we have long stressed the importance of a so-called learned clergy. In our American Presbyterian tradition, that includes a graduate level education and study of the Bible in its original languages. It includes theological training 
that, among other things, provides a depth of understanding of baptism and the Lord's Supper. At its best, it's an education that encourages both a growing faith and the development of critical thinking skills. As good as that might sound, having this sort of leadership in the church also poses some challenges, which to some extent have always been with us. The first we could label the problem of elitism. Doesn't this emphasis on academic training put us in danger of taking the Bible out of the hands of God's people? Can, quote unquote, ordinary Christians be trusted to understand it and interpret it correctly? The correct answer, I think, is a both and sort of answer. This also has roots in the Reformation, in a principle known as the perspicuity of Scripture. If you'd like a good word for your vocabulary calendar this week. This is a confidence that the central message of the Bible is clear to everyone who reads it. So salvation is open to all. But at the same time, anyone who has tried to read the Bible from cover to cover knows that it doesn't take all that long to run into questions, some of which involve matters of translation or historical context or literary understanding some of which may take years of study and wisdom and experience to unravel and put into perspective. And so there is a place in the life of the church for biblical scholars, too. An analogy might be this. I often think of spiritual practices as being like a diet and exercise program for our faith. Thinking this way, listening to a sermon might be compared to eating at a restaurant, hopefully a good one. You expect the chef to have knowledge and skills that you don't have, but let you appreciate food in a different way than what you cook at home. But we also need good, well-prepared, nutritious home cooking. Both have their place. No one would seek to live by eating only in a restaurant and doing that just once a week or even less often. On the other hand, it's important for biblical scholars to partake of some home cooking too, to read the Bible devotionally, not only with their heads, but with their hearts. The second challenge we face in sustaining this witness of word and sacrament we could call a problem of access. The most recent annual statistics for the Presbyterian Church USA were just released this week. At the end of 2021, 67% or two thirds of our congregations reported having 100 or fewer members. And 20% of our churches have fewer than 25 for these congregations, getting access to the services of those deeply trained pastors we value so highly can be difficult. Many rely on the ministry of retired ministers of Word and Sacrament. Others are served by commissioned ruling elders. These are elders from our local congregations who are trained and commissioned by their presbyteries. Many have wonderful pastoral gifts and many are active, lifelong learners, but they don't have a chance to pursue a full course of theological education. And many of our smallest churches get by with a different pulpit supply preacher every week, basically whoever they can find to put into the pulpit. As our old ways of being the church evolve in our turbulent world, the church faces challenges in how to form and deploy a faithful ministry of word and sacrament. It's not just a Presbyterian challenge, of course. I'm not really quite sure why I went off in this direction today, which seems even to me to be a big tangent from the Easter story. 
Because the power of Jesus' resurrection becomes real to us. As we have in our own ways a personal experience of the risen Christ. It's the personal reality of his resurrection that turns our sadness and confusion into joy and amazement. But I've been preoccupied this week with the idea that a faithful witness to his resurrection in today's world begins as it always has with the word and the sacraments. And as I look around at the church today, and what it means to tell the story of Jesus in our world with all its complexity and diversity and turmoil. These times call for men and women to lead us who have a depth of faith and understanding and wisdom. Who can tell that old, old, very simple story in ways that connect with the depth of God's spirit and the challenges of the world today. This is something that we don't talk about a lot among ourselves in local churches. And maybe that's what pulled me in this direction today. So I invite you to pray with me for our pastors and commissioned ruling elders for our presbyteries and seminaries, for our scholars and Bible translators, that those two enduring witnesses, word and sacrament, may continue to be passed on faithfully from generation to generation, that the world's sadness and confusion may be transformed by the power of the risen Christ into joy and amazement. Amen.
please pray with me. We praise you, Lord, that you have revealed yourself to us in the glory and the mystery of the risen Christ. We pray that the Spirit will work within us to remove from us our sadness and confusion and fill us anew with joy and amazement at your grace and power and love. We pause this morning to remember those moments of joy and amazement that we have experienced in our lives and even in these last weeks, these last few days. And we offer to you those points of sadness and confusion in our lives, asking that you would touch us, that you would reveal yourself again. And we remember before you those near to us and dear to us who struggle with these things, who are sad, who are burdened with illness, who struggle with how to live in the world, who are confused about their own lives and this world that we live in. And we thank you for those two enduring witnesses, the word and the sacraments. And we thank you for those that you have called to lead us into your word our pastors, our commissioned ruling elders, our seminary professors and scholars, members of our churches who teach Sunday school and lead Bible studies. And we pray, Lord, that in these changing times when so much is shifting in the world and in the way the church is living in the world, that you would show us new ways to continue to study your word together, to train leaders with depth and wisdom and faithful hearts, that we might continue to bear that witness of the scriptures and the sacraments. We thank you for all the variety of gifts that you bring together in your church, even as we lift up these particular ones today. We thank you for those who deliver Meals on Wheels, for those who visit and write cards, for those who provide a welcome to strangers. So many ways that you have gifted this people. As we pray for our community this week, I would lift up in particular our friend Vinnie Marandino. Vinnie received a lifetime honor from his denomination, the Assembly of God, this week for his service as a chaplain in our prison and hospital and to our police department. And we pray for his health as this is a time of great struggle for him. We thank you for the work of Serenity Hospice and the other organizations that provide hospice care in our community for those particular gifts that they bring into people's lives at such a crucial and tender time. And we pray, as we always do, for those who lead our city and our state and our nation, and for the leaders of our world as they struggle to know how to contain the power of evil in the world. We pray that you would bless us all, even as we offer these prayers in the name of Jesus, our Savior, who taught us when we pray to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
And now let's sing together one more time.